having observed God's willingness to transform discrete territories and cultures, only one question remains. Can this happen at a national level? Is there any evidence of God at work in a modern state, a sovereign nation? The East African nation of Uganda seems an unlikely place to look for answers. Racked with demonic fevers, this one-time pearl of Africa has spent decades in a deep spiritual coma. Its very name has become synonymous with death. As the nursery of AIDS, and as Idi Amin's personal house of horrors. I think Uganda has been a country of pain, a country which has gone through one military coup to another. I know what it means to live in fear. Pastor John Melindi was a teenager when the horror began. People have been killed in, in, in thousands, massacres, whole villages being massacred. And sometimes you would not know exactly who is doing the killing. Those who listen to John Melindi's vivid tales may squirm. His body lay there for two days. Or even weep. And the baby had pulled out the breast of a dead mother. But they will always remember. We did not recognize what we were fighting against. Uganda's history, like that of many African nations, is filled with magic practices and secret rituals. Fetishes known as Mayembe were everywhere and kings, even to the days of Idi Amin, are known to have offered human sacrifices. Africans are covenant people, if I may say. Much of what we have is covenanted to the devil. Our history tells us that our ancestors worship other gods other than the god of Abraham. For Uganda, the consequence of this idolatry has been a long season of fear and pain. What I knew about Idi Amin was a towering figure with the, who wanted to throw around his weight and wanted his presence felt all over. Journalist and, uh, Mark Kukuza grew up under the shadow of Uganda's infamous tyrant. Like many of his countrymen, he was optimistic when Amin's overthrow led to the return of former president Milton Obote. But they thought that maybe Obote would be better than Idi Amin, but it wasn't. There were powers of darkness behind these people that you're looking at, which were tearing apart this nation. In those days, it was common to find bodies lying by the roadside, and sometimes people would go to look over just to make sure, is it a person I know, a loved one? If not, they would just go on. And it wasn't just soldiers doing the killing. I was born to die. Pastor Jackson Sinyanga was just three months old when his mother threw him into the garbage. And uh, my grandma picked me up. Assuming he would die within a matter of days, an aunt agreed to take him in. But the boy lived, if only to revisit the pain. My father was murdered uh, in 79 during Idi Amin. And uh, at the funeral, that's when I first saw the picture or the face of my mother, never a letter, never a picture, no nothing. And I was already a teenager. Sadly, Jackson's father was part of a national epidemic. One day passed, two days without your loved one coming home. Then you know, maybe, maybe he's, a, he's dead. So the first place to go to would be Namave Forest. It was a forest of death. You could feel the spirit of death there, the heaviness of death. Prayer meetings went underground. Pastors circulated between as many as 10 groups a day, always at great peril, and often arriving home in the wee hours. The soldiers had power to do whatever they want. There would be road checks. I was stopped in road checks many times, and you would never know how you're going to come out. On one occasion, a mother traveling with an infant was asked for the baby's identity papers. And of course, the babies don't have identity papers. And the baby was snatched from her, thrown up into the air, and the soldier raised a knife, and the baby came and plunged on that knife. And by 1984, they began killing churchmen. They began killing pastors. Pastor Jotham Mutebi was in the middle of a sermon when Amin's soldiers burst into his church with guns blazing. As the bullets tore through the sanctuary, several elderly women rose and made their way to the altar. And when I saw them, 
I thought these people were so desperate and that they needed comfort. So I raised up my arms and uh, prayed over them. But I came to learn later that the reason they came, they wanted to die with me, their pastor. Instead, Pastor Mutebi and his parishioners were herded into hijacked trucks and taken to the dreaded Nakasero Center. Just a few uh, meters away from where we are was this Nakasero State Research Bureau. That was the torture chambers. The sadism and violence were unspeakable. They could put 60 people in a room that is just by uh, three by three meters, and they are crammed in to the point that a person would die and stay upright, held up by the bodies of the other living ones. There were no investigations. Things would happen, and that would be the end of it. It seemed the entire world had turned its back on the horrors in Uganda. Men have deserted us. Millions died. The bodies clogging the Owen Falls Dam and the shores of nearby Lake Victoria. We need to repent for whatever sins of our past. We defile our country. We are not any better than Cain. This preoccupation with killing took its toll on the nation's economy and infrastructure. The factories broke down, essential com commodities became scarce and almost unknown. You couldn't get soap, you couldn't get anything. The city was dirty and uh, most of your buildings were damaged. The morals of the people were so broken that you could not get a single thing done without having to pay for it. Just when it seemed things could not get any worse, they did. This time, the news was delivered by the World Health Organization. It was being predicted that by 1997, AIDS would be so bad in Uganda that one third of the population will have died. Dr. Patrobus Mufubenga is an accomplished physician serving with Uganda's National Institute of Health. During this time, everybody was desperate. Uh, all of us, we are losing our dear ones. Uganda has been crying to God, just like the voice was heard in Lama, women crying for their sons. The pain, the suffering, the sorrow, the fear, no one could console. They developed a saying before that said uh, that the God of Uganda had gone to sleep. In the middle of the night, there's one old man who stood up and pointed his cane to the pastors and said, where is this God you preach about? The God of power, the God who answers prayer. What has Uganda done to God? It looks like God hates us. From the depths of the grave I called for help, and you listened to my cry. I said I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you. And they began praying day and night, day and night, day and night. It came through a lot of crying, a lot of waiting. There were times he had, they had to go into the swamps and stay in the water, hidden in the papyrus reeds. So they would spend the whole day there, and in the night they would come out. And they would, they would then get together and pray. This was deep, groaning prayer. I am the man who has seen affliction. My eyes will flow unceasingly without relief until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees. I would choose to seek God until he answers prayer. If he's not going to answer, then I would rather die seeking him. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. And the presence of God would come down as the people cried out to God. And it would be manifest to the physical eye like a cloud, a heavy cloud of mist hanging over the people. But when you walk into the meeting, you, you are immediately swallowed in. You know you are entering something that is tangible.
15 years ago, this was one of the most dangerous places in all of Uganda. This community was known as the Beirut of Kampala because under the regime of Milton Obote, undisciplined soldiers used to use the homes and shops in this area for target practice. Hopelessness hung over this community like a wet blanket. It was into this place that God led a young Ugandan evangelist by the name of Robert Kayanja. He was accompanied by six intercessors. This is our waning war where we used to pray. I Besides to contending with lawless soldiers, Robert's team was also confronted by a powerful witch doctor named Musoki. I mean, there was kind of a fear that walked with this man. After being threatened with death, the intercessors cried out to God. Within days, it was Musoki who was dead. After the death of this uh, famous witch, Musoki, we begin to see the heavens open. Kayanja's tiny congregation became a vast multitude. The Miracle Center Cathedral now seats 10,000 people, and the fellowship has given birth to 600 daughter congregations. Uganda, which had been written off by many, many countries, whose economy had totally collapsed, which had no voice at all, and whose people were ashamed of being called Ugandans, began making a turnaround. And the healing process began. Not surprisingly, it is a change fueled by prayer. So churches began to pray in zones. It's like bees. You can hear bees through the night. Every community praying, every zone praying. And I felt like, you know what? The enemy must find another city, but not Kampala. Unity is another hallmark of the present revival. The work that God has been doing in this land cannot be claimed by any individual or any church or any ministry. Citywide pastors' gatherings are common. God is calling us now together to pray together, to praise together. It is really happening that God is bringing churches together to talk to each other, to appreciate one another. What I'm trying to do is to go with those people who love Jesus, who preach the word of God. Sometimes you find me in Pentecostal churches. I do go there. The body of Christ is coming together. I am overwhelmed. The revival we are involved in now is for everybody. And unity is not something we're praying for, but something we are thanking God for. Even the dire World Health Organization report on AIDS did not shake the believer's confidence in God. We have seen the AIDS virus healed, and the doctors go, wow, I can't explain this, but there must be a God up there somewhere. I had chest pain, I had the skin rash. I started vomiting. These were terminal cases. I lost the appetite, I couldn't eat. People with full-blown AIDS. I grew very, very thin as a poor. After what being prayed for, many oh, sensed God's heart. touch. That there is something changing that at that, that very moment, that very night, the power of God came down, and I felt it. Not surprisingly, these self-proclaimed healings elicited serious skepticism from medical caregivers. Why have you bothered yourself to come here? because your status and your appearance shows that you are a victim. But in time, this skepticism turned to amazement. My doctor looked at me. He was amazed. He said, hey, are you still living? I was checked. There's no AIDS. They read my name, Ruth Bilabwa, HIV negative. And they told me you are HIV negative, nanoreactive. There's no virus in your body. Then the rest of the symptoms start to disappear one by one. God had healed me totally. It and was a refrain now, heard thousands of times across Uganda. But as I talk to you right now, I have experienced over 372 AIDS patients being healed. Uganda has been recorded as one of the first countries to see a decline in HIV. We believe it's because of our prayer, and we believe it's because of the love and the grace of God. It is also because Uganda has promoted abstinence and faithfulness as their primary weapons against AIDS. I vowed before you that if you heal me, I'll tell all the people, I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. 
The power of God has also been manifested in the political arena. I believe Uganda is in a new beginning politically. In divine timing, God brought leadership. God began to put people in place. God is working in this country. Paul Atiang has held nearly every post in Uganda's government, including prime minister. The Lord has always been with me. But it's the Lord who makes character. Beatrice Bayenka is a member of parliament from the Hoima district. So I want to, to be more firm in everything that I do and so that the light may so shine. They expect us to reflect Christ. And Stephen Unyo is the nation's deputy police commissioner. I'm one of those who believe that God must talk to me, especially in this type of job I am. On a number of occasions, Unyo has seen God quell violent riots in answer to prayer. And I believe out of my personal experience, children of God, if we continue in prayer, there is nothing impossible. But I've taken my faith up to the governmental level. Cecilia Adam Ogwal is the fiery leader of Uganda's parliamentary opposition. Uh, I am an ambassador of Christ. And I'm not ashamed to testify that anywhere I go. As we saw the government changing and the spiritual realm being changed, we felt, you know what? The God of Uganda has not gone to sleep yet. The gospel has introduced new changes even in the structure of the government. Now we have a new ministry called the Ministry of Ethics and Integrity. We never used to have that. God put me in this position. God needed a I tough person for a tough assignment. And when I was tussling with getting born again, I told him, I want you to get me hold of me like you did with Saul on the way to Damascus. And he did it. Miriam Matembe remembers the day she stood before the president and his cabinet to explain her portfolio. Her words were prophetic. Do you remember the story of the children of the Israelites in the slavery and how Moses led them from the promised land? Ah, here I am. I'm the Moses of Uganda. The Lord has appointed me here to lead Uganda from UNESCO conduct moral decadency, corruption to the right direction. As the source of the river that once carried a younger Moses to his destiny, Uganda is again on the highway to history. And the journey is nowhere more evident than in the government's aggressive plan to build ethics and integrity in public office. I knew that the battle is very hard and difficult, but the Lord is with me. Today there's a lot of corruption in Uganda, but if we look back to how it was 15 years ago, it's just incomparable. Judge Julia Sabutendi is a special prosecutor appointed by the president, a fervent Christian. Her corruption-free reputation has brought new energy and credibility to the campaign. What she has unearthed has shocked the whole nation, and people are trembling, big shots. The files are full to refresh our memory, talk to us. She is what she is because she's born again, because she has stood her ground. And to see that today people are coming back to this place of integrity is amazing. We have seen God do great things until crime rate drops 50%. Not surprisingly, this new attitude is impacting the national economy. While things are still tough, positive signs are everywhere. An economy which was predicted to collapse has not collapsed as such, but it has been among the three fastest growing economies in Africa. And Uganda's churches are growing even faster than her economy. And we went from seven people to 2,000 people in two weeks. Not bad for a young man who was once tossed onto a garbage heap. Today, it's amazing. We have five services on Sunday morning and uh, we're averaging about 20,000 people. And today, I'll tell you, our church is not the only church that God's growing. And there is revival, immense, immense revival going on within our churches. Every day in Uganda, there is a new church starting up or a ministry starting up. Once we have set ourselves free from the sin of our past, then we need to focus on the purpose of God.
On New Year's Eve, 1999, Uganda joined the rest of the world in celebrating the arrival of a new millennium. But there was a special character to the Ugandan celebration. His is the invisible hand that has moved us along and shaped our destiny. Ten weeks earlier, we First Lady Janet Museveni had invited people. several church leaders to a meeting. So when she came in, she told us she had a vision. As we enter the new millennium, can't we organize a time of thanksgiving to God for the way God has got us through this period? I mean, she had re requested that we dedicate the nation officially back to God. Good morning to all of you. And happy New Year. So in the presence of the President and First Lady, we covenanted the nation to God for the next 1,000 years. The covenant, which included the signatures of the President and First Lady, was remarkably explicit. We are conscious that we have It read like a passage out of the Old Testament. Covenanting our nation, Uganda, to the purposes of God and to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen. Then the king called together all the people from the least to the greatest. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord. From beginning to end, and it was just God. Get shame come my face, O oh Lord, my God. Shame and reproach, Lord, come my heart. Watching these fervent assemblies, one is confronted with a glorious irony. Dictators once tried to destroy the nation's faith by preventing people from entering church buildings. Instead, the edicts and padlocks served only to remind believers that the church has nothing to do with buildings. When Uganda's faith was taken outdoors, into football stadiums, banks, hotels, even parliamentary offices, it flourished. Jesus is standing on the right hand telling the Father, Father, I'm ready for Uganda. And Uganda that was once used to be the power of Africa was now about ready to shine again. It's amazing for people who lived at that time to see what's happening now. Life has come. It seems there's, there's a new king reigning over the nation of Uganda. Uganda is ready for God as a nation. It's astounding. It really is a miracle. Nobody can deny it. It wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been for the Lord. To those who would ask, why did God move so powerfully in these particular regions? The answer is simple. He was invited.